All right, so there's the theme for Vacation Bible School. If you'll grab your Bibles and if you'll pull out your sermon notes guide that's in your bulletin and grab a pen, because if you're going to pray for VBS the way we would like for you to this week, you're going to need to write some things down that we're going to have on the screen for you uh, so that you can be praying each night with the appropriate themes and so you can look at the scriptures that are going to be shared with the kids each night of the week as well. As you saw there, our key verse is from 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, that God's divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who has called us by glory and virtue. So that's what the kids are going to be taught, that God is going to equip them for everything that He has in store for them, especially as it relates to their relationships with him through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And before we jump into that some more, let me just say that for many of us who grew up in the church, uh, this is a formative week for, li- for the lives of our children. And for some of you, you can remember an event at VBS that stays with you right to this morning, and it'll stay with you the rest of your life. And for some of our kids, some of those moments will happen for them this week and they will carry that moment with them for the rest of their lives. Years ago, I shared a story with you about my own childhood before my father gave his life to the Lord, uh, which radically transformed our house, and before my mom got real serious about her commitment to Jesus Christ. uh, There was a Dutch Reformed church down the road from where we lived, and they had vacation Bible school programs each summer, and I would go to those programs. And on this one occasion, I was riding my bike past the church to go to a friend's house, and the church leaders had put out a VBS sign. And on one side, it just gave you the information for you know, when VBS was each day. On the other side was a big poster. And in the poster, it was all pictures from different aspects and, and events in the ministry of our Lord. And I remember as I was driving up to it, I thought, well, I want to look at that poster. So I turned my bike around. I went over there. And I was standing there looking at the poster. And For whatever reason, the Holy Spirit used just the pictures in a similar way that stained glass is supposed to function for us. It doesn't doesn't say anything to us. We don't hear anything verbally, audibly from the stained glass windows. But certainly when we see the pictures of a stained glass window, it's supposed to draw us into those moments of the life and the work of our Lord and deepen our walk with him as we just take a moment to reflect. That's exactly what that poster did to me. I mean, it's like, bam, like, wow. That's Jesus. That's Jesus when he was feeding the 5,000. You know, that's Jesus when he was walking on the water. And that's Peter sinking in the water. And, and, I, and I actually just put my, threw my bike down and sat down in front of that poster and just stared at it. And I felt a real powerful connection to God just looking at that poster. I remember it as if it happened yesterday. And it, it just, for, I probably sat there for five minutes, but looking back from this point in my life, it might as well have been five hours because of the way that sense of connection to God occurred. And and likewise, some of our kids are going to experience something like that this week, and you need to pray for them that they'll hold on to those moments for the rest of their lives. Now, before we jump into uh, the aspect of each theme, I want you to look at 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27. That's a passage, the whole theme of Bible school is game on, God's going to prepare you for the game that you're involved in, it's no game at all, I mean Christianity is the most important thing in life, we're not talking about temporal things here, we're talking about your soul and we're talking about eternity, and just like our Lord said, what would it profit if a man or a woman gained the whole world but yet lost his or her soul? The answer is profits zero. Matter of fact, it's a huge loss. You don't even go balance out at zero. I mean, it's a loss, a complete loss of the most important thing. And so when it comes to athletics, certainly if a person's going to uh, try to win an athletic event, there's an incredible amount of preparation that goes in to trying to win that event. You don't just show up on, on the academic field, or I'm sorry, the athletic field, and just expect you're going to win if you haven't put in any prior preparation and work. And that's exactly what the apostle is getting at here in 1 Corinthians 9. He says, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Of course, that's before the day and age of PC where everybody in the entire race gets a a medal. 
But, I mean, even when we're going to be really serious about this, like let's say the Olympics, in the Olympics, only one person's going to get the gold. And in order to do that, you need to run in such a way that you are preparing before the race even occurs. So your whole life becomes the race. The run isn't just the moment of the run. Your whole life is about that run, that one moment where you're going for it all, which is exactly what he says in verses, uh, the rest of verses 24 and following. Run in such a way that you may obtain that prize. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. And certainly that's the case. Again, look at professional athletes. Look at uh, uh, Olympic athletes who are really in many ways, though we don't send our, quote, professional athletes, end quote, to the Olympics, they are professionals. They've given their lives to that event. Do they just eat whatever they want to eat when they go out to the restaurant with friends and family? No. Why? It's, it's all about the event. They are temperate. They are disciplined in their eating habits. Do they get up whenever they want in the morning? No. Some of these people, and even young people, they're up at 4 o'clock in the morning to go and train for this Olympic event before they go and do their schooling or they go to some other uh, task. They are, they are very temperate, that is, disciplined in everything, all because of this goal that they have. And that's why the apostle says in verse 25, this is what's amazing about it. Now they do this to obtain a perishable crown. Does anybody remember who won the 100-yard dash? I mean, the 100-yard, that's, that's a pretty important race. Anybody remember who, who won that at the last Olympics by name? You kidding me? I mean, as much work and energy as the person put in who got the gold, you don't remember who it was? How about the, the, what hockey team in the last Winter Olympics, what nation won? Does anybody remember? Nobody remembers? No, I mean, you think about how much time and effort and energy that entire team collectively put into that, that, that entire, I mean, year. I mean, they won the gold medal, for, for crying out loud. We don't Oh, you know, we could go on again, again and again and again. And here's the thing. It's a perishable crown. But then he goes on to say that we are striving for an imperishable crown. Which is why in verse 26 he says, Therefore, run like this. The, the Christian race that you have now become a part of, run the race like this, not with uncertainty. Don't run as if, you know, is this really worth it? You know, is God really going to be there for me? I mean, no, no, no. Run with certainty. There is a prize at the end, and the prize is worth absolutely everything you're giving for it. Run with certainty. Also, he says, don't fight as one who just beats the air. No, I mean, get involved and actually push yourself to your limits all for the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ, which is why he says at the end of that section in verse 27, I will discipline my body and I will bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself would be disqualified from the race or from the event. Live your Christianity like that. But here's the amazing thing that you see in churches all around, and to some degree you see it in our own lives. We, we treat Christianity and church in general like it's an intramural activity, like it's just a pickup game. And then for our larger culture's obsession with sports, and, and there's no doubt that's what it is, it's an absolute obsession. You, you look at how much we pay athletes and you say, well, it's just all capitalism, you know, and, and it's just a, a matter of a marketing and it's, it's the amount of money the teams bring in. And you look at academics, look at colleges and, and the disproportionate attention that's placed upon athletics rather than the academics when the colleges were there for the academics in the first place. And the athletics were just intramurals. That's what they were back in the time when those colleges first started. And it's so out of balance. And, and then you look at this as well. And again, it's a cultural issue. If you were to transfer the level of commitment that coaches ask for from our young people over to a youth group, you would be very concerned for your family members and friends who are in that youth group because you would say they're in a cult. You would say that there is no way they should be asked to give that much time, that much energy, that much money, to give up that much for that. And yet, wait a second, when we're talking about the ministry, we're talking about an imperishable, eternal crown. 
when we're talking about sports, even if you're talking about the Olympics, even if you're talking about professional basketball or baseball or football, you're talking about a perishable crown that just in a few generations, they won't even remember your name. So with that, what are we trying to teach our kids this week, which really is the same thing we need to learn as adults? This is what we're going to show you now on the screen, and this is where you need to write these things down. This is what we're going to be sharing, the scripture passages, the, the gist of the story, and the point that we want the kids to go home with for every night of VBS. There's five nights of VBS, and this is what I want to ask you to do. I want you to take this list, and of course, you've got to put your part in it as well. You've got to write down these things. And every night, I want you to pray. Every day and every night, I want you to pray for the children and for their leaders that are going to be a part of the VBS program and pray for the homes that those children represent. But I would also encourage you to do this. At some point during your day, read the passage of Scripture that the kids are going to be taught that night and ask the Lord to speak to you in the same manner that the children are going to be taught that night. So, for example, today is day one for VBS. Our story is from Luke chapter 15, uh, the lost sheep. And the point we want the kids to get is that Jesus cares for you. God, through his son Jesus Christ, cares for you. A basic, ba basic principle of Christianity. But you need to know that as an adult just as much as the kids need to know that. And then, as you ask the Lord to speak to you, you'll appreciate all the more what we're speaking to the kids. And so, first night, as I said, this very, very aspect of coming to the Lord and understanding He cares for us. Uh, don't feel like you're entering into something that the children are doing, because remember what God said to us through our Lord and Savior in Matthew chapter 18, when Jesus takes a child and sets the child right in the midst of them, and He says, unless you become... One, converted, and two, like little children, you will not experience the power of God. He said, you will not experience the kingdom of heaven. But that phrase is an expression, it's a euphemism for the power of God. Unless you first convert, that is, you, you turn away from the things of the world and you turn toward the things of God. You stop seeking worldly things and the glory of the world and you start seeking the kingdom of God. Unless you convert, and then become like a child, you won't experience God's power. Now, what does this become like a child mean? Do you remember what it was like to live without any major concerns? Do you, I don't know how far back you need to go for that, but however far back you need to go in your life, where you did not have all of the stresses and the strains and the worry of this world on your shoulders, do you remember how great that was? Well, that's where God wants you to get in your relationship with him. I mean, probably not too many of us woke up this morning fretting about whether or not the sun would supernova and destroy not only Earth, but all of the other planets, you know, in, in our system here, you know. But guess who controls that power? And he's the same one that controls the events of our lives. And even though things may not be going exactly the way we want them to go, you've got to come to that place where you can trust him. Just like the song that Kelly sang for us, can you absolutely trust the healer? Can you absolutely trust the Savior? When you do, you're going to have a power unlike anything else. The power of God, the kingdom of heaven in your very midst. So the very first lesson for our kids, the very first lesson for all of us as the children of God is that Jesus Christ cares about us. In Luke chapter 15, I'm going to run the story for you, verses 1 through 7. Uh, the Pharisees, the ta they see that Jesus is with tax collectors and sinners. And they're upset about that. And Jesus challenges them, and he says to them, well, let me ask you this, or let me share a story with you. There's a man who has a hundred sheep, and one of them goes astray. It, wouldn't a person who really cares about his sheep, wouldn't any of you, if you owned a hundred sheep and one of them went astray, put the 99 in the care of somebody that you can trust, and then off you go to find that one? And when you actually find that one, you put it on your shoulders, and you bring it back home. And when you get home, you say to your friends and to your family members, come and rejoice with me. For that lamb that was lost, I have found it. And he says, and so I say to you, likewise will be the rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that converts than 99 who were just and, and who needed no conversion. 
Now, what's the point of the story there? The point of the story isn't how great the one lamb is that went astray. The point of the story is how incredible the love and the care of the shepherd is. That a true shepherd that loves and cares for the flock is going to do everything to protect that flock. That's how God loves you. No matter how much you may be hurting this morning because of some circumstances in your life, you need to hold on to this like one of the children in VBS, that God loves you. And God cares for you. Just like this shepherd who will search out this one lamb and rejoice when he finds it, so it is with God and you. Yet the scriptures tell us elsewhere in Isaiah that all we like sheep have gone astray. You know, at some point, every one of us gets distracted by things of this world. No matter how much we may, may have a relationship with God, all of us get distracted by the things of this world. And instead of seeking that vertical relationship with God, we begin to seek and try to meet our needs with the horizontal relationships and experiences that we can have in this life. And let me tell you, it will always leave you short. When you decide you're going to be, when you're distracted consciously or unconsciously and you leave the fold of God and you go off on your own, you know, and, and, and that is a very dangerous place to be, believe me, you will never be satisfied off on your own. You will only be satisfied when you're with the shepherd. Paul Tripp, who wrote Dangerous Calling, and I've mentioned this to you a couple weeks ago, this book, he has a section in which he's talking about worship the worship experience being a war. He calls it a glory war. That every time we come into worship, we're entering into a struggle for glory. And what glory are we going to seek? Are we going to seek the glory of God, which will give us strength and peace and confidence, and it will help us to know that God cares, that he is our Savior and Lord? Or are we going to seek the glory of this world, the things that this world says will bring meaning and purpose into our lives? And when we seek the glory of the world, we're really seeking our own glory, not the glory of God. We've got to seek the glory of God. And Tripp was a pastor for many years, and this he writes, looking back on his experience as a pastor, and every time he would step up into a pulpit, knowing the variety of situations that were in the pews in front of him, he writes this, I know I'm addressing a single lady who has her heart set on the affection of a certain young man whom she thinks will deliver to her the happiness that she's been craving. Sitting before me is the teenager who can't think beyond the glories of Facebook or Twitter or the Portal 2 video game. In the congregation is a middle-aged man whose heart is captured by the glory of somehow, some way, recapturing his youth. A wife is sitting there wondering if she will ever experience the glory of the kind of marriage that she has dreamed about, the kind she knows that others have. A man sits in the crowd knowing that he feeds his soul almost daily on the dark and distorted glories of pornography and has become a master at shifting spiritual gears. Some listening are more excited about a new outfit or a new home or a new car or a new shotgun or a newly sodded lawn the opening of a new restaurant, a new vacation site, or that new promotion than they are about the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes, they come into worship in the middle of a war that they probably don't even recognize. It's a war for the allegiance, for the worship of their hearts. And in ways they probably don't understand, they have again and again and again asked the creation to give them what only the creator can provide. They have looked horizontally again and again for what can only be found vertically, and they have asked people, situations, locations, and experiences to be the one thing that they can never, ever be, their Savior. You've got one Savior. That's Jesus Christ, the Lord, the great shepherd of the sheep. And you need to know what we're going to tell the kids tonight. He cares about you. If that doesn't bring you to tears, you've lost the awe of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He cares about you. Whatever you're going through, he cares about you. Maybe one thing to know he cares and, and that he says he's there, but sometimes in life we struggle. And, and we struggle 
to believe that we can change to be the people he wants us to be. Now, our kids, they're not going to know this experientially or cognitively for years to come, but, but we know this as adults. That's why the next story, tomorrow night's story, is from John chapter 11. It's the raising of Lazarus from the dead. In John chapter 11, and again, we're not going to read verses 1 through 44, but as you write that down, at some point tomorrow, read John 11, verse 1 through verse 44, as Jesus raises his friend from the dead. Running the story, you know the gist of it. Jesus is very close with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. They live in Bethany. He spent a lot of time with them. He hears that Lazarus is sick, and the family isn't just asking. They're pleading with him to come because they know that he can heal Lazarus of whatever it is that ails him. And it looks like what's ailing him is so significant, it may kill him. But Jesus deliberately tarries. And then he gets the word, Lazarus is dead. And Jesus says, Lazarus is sleeping and let's, let's go, and, and we will wake him. And his disciples are like, uh, I think he's dead. Like, dead, dead. Like, D-E-D, -E dead, right? Just seeing if you're paying attention. <laughs> and, and so, Jesus goes, Martha, Martha comes out and greets him. And Martha says, Lord, had you been here, our brother would have lived. And he says, well, I'll tell you this, your brother will rise again. And she said, I know that. On the last day, he will rise in the resurrection. Now, Jesus is like, no, I mean, he's going to rise again like today. And, and she's like, but not, you know, he doesn't say that right to her yet. But she says, I, I, I believe in the resurrection. Do you believe in the resurrection? Most of you do. You believe in the last day? Most of you do. But do you believe God has the power to change radically today? Mm, I don't know. I don't know if I've seen that. See, we can be just like Martha. And he says to Martha, Martha, I'm telling you, I am the resurrection and the life, and he who believes in me, even though he may die, yet he shall live. Your brother will live. Do you believe this? And it's interesting because she kind of skirts the direct question. He said, do you believe that your brother will live? Not in the last day at the resurrection. Do you believe your brother will live? And she says, yes, Lord, I believe you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Believing that Jesus is the Christ and believing that Jesus cares is a little bit different from believing that Jesus is present in your life and will change you for the glory of God. There's a lot of people that believe in Jesus. There's a lot of people that believe in the resurrection. There's a lot of people that believe in the last day, but they don't believe Jesus can change them today. And he says, move the stone. Oh, oh, Lord, Lord, it's going to stink. He's been dead for four days. Move the stone. And then many of you know, he says, Lazarus, come forth, and I love it. I mean, I've heard it so many times from other pastors, but still it's, it's worth saying again that the reason Jesus had to say Lazarus and say his name is if he hadn't said Lazarus, every person who was buried in that cave would have walked out because that's the power that he has. I love it. I mean, I don't know how long pastors have been saying that, but we just need to keep saying it because it's such a powerful and true part of the story. The lesson for our kids tomorrow night is that Jesus will give them hope. Now, what that means to a three-year-old, what that means is different from what it means for a seven-year-old, a seven-year-old who's, who's, whose home is perhaps in so much turmoil, that little seven-year-old knows he needs Jesus' help and he needs Jesus' hope. But that's also very different from what it means for a 30-year-old who's sitting in this sanctuary or a 30-year-old who's going to share that lesson with some of the kids tomorrow night or a 50-year-old or an 80-year-old but you know what? No matter where you are, whether you're in the nursery department or you're a senior, senior adult, you need to know that Jesus gives you hope. And if he can raise Lazarus after being four days in a tomb, you better believe that he can change you and me for his glory and honor. On Tuesday night, we're going to be talking about believing Thomas. It's often called Doubting Thomas, because certainly when he hears about the resurrected Lord uh, in John chapter 20, he's doubtful, and he says to the other disciples who've seen the risen Lord, and they're telling him about it, he says, look, I love you guys. You know, there's really no reason for me to not believe you guys, but I'm just going to tell you the way my mind works, until I see the scars, until I actually see him, I've got a hard time wrapping my mind around this. And then lo and behold, they're all in the room together, and what happens? right through the wall, here comes Jesus, you know. Hey, Thomas, what were you just saying? Here, here, 
Look at, look at them. See with your eyes the scars. Touch them with your own hands. Here, look at my side. This is the soldier that pierced me through. Here is the wound. Blessed are you because you, you see, but even more blessed are those who don't have to see and yet will believe. Let me tell you, there is a part to us as human beings, especially as we transition from childhood to adulthood, that we have to know that we have to walk by faith, not by sight. We have to continue to believe, and we need Jesus' help in order to believe. Years ago, Marla Patterson's mother was passing away, and, and uh, Mark and Marla brought their daughter Alexis, uh, and Alexis was just a young girl, very small girl at the time. And uh, they brought her to see her grandmother for the, what they knew would be the last time. And they did an excellent job kind of preparing her as best they could as parents. They even got her a little book about the passing of a loved one, and, and she went through the book with her parents. But they brought her in there, and they said to her, um, you know, this is, this, you need to say goodbye to Nanny, and um, this, she's going to go to heaven. And, and uh, Alexis, she believed everything that her parents taught her. And I'll never forget, as Marla uh, described to me, that as the conversation went on, they wondered how Alexis would handle it. Alexis was fine, and then as she was leaving, they, said, they were saying their goodbyes. As Alexis got to the threshold of the door, as soon as she hit the threshold of the door, she just turned around and waved her hand and said, See you in heaven, Nanny, with a smile on her face. Let me tell you, something happens, though, from that kind of belief that we have as children to where we are as adults. And it doesn't just happen in the pews. It happens in the pulpit as well, where there are a lot of pastors, there are a lot of music ministers, there are a lot of ministers of discipleship and administration that they believed at one point when they were young. Oh, they believed. But then as life went on and situations occurred and God didn't do what they thought he was going to do, or they see the discouragements, the belief changes in a way. And then pretty soon, they're coming up into the pulpit, or they're standing behind the guitar, or they're talking about discipleship, and yet the real belief in the risen Lord Jesus the Christ is gone. And they're just going through the motions. And let me tell you, that's the last thing God ever wants to see happen to his children. If today you are really struggling with believing and all you've been doing for a long time is going to church, it's been a long time since you've been the church with the power of the Holy Spirit and the gospel of Jesus Christ driving you on to greater belief in him. Let me tell you, God wants you to know today, not only does he care about you, not only is he going to give you hope, he's going to help you to believe again. Like the child that Jesus set right in his midst and said, look, unless you start to trust like this one, this little one, you're not going to understand the full power that I have to offer you. But when you will trust me like this little one trusts, I can give you every bit of power I can offer. That's Tuesday night, believing Thomas. And then Wednesday night, now you've got a little bit of penmanship to jump into now. You've got a lot of scripture verses there. What is the focus for the kids Wednesday night on our fourth night of VBS? Here's the focus. That God has given us his word to prove to us that he loves us. And these are passages that just refer to John writing about Jesus in order to affirm Jesus' love for us. There are people, we all need to hear that we're loved. Every time I, I, uh, I'm going to marry a couple, we go through pre-marriage counseling. And in the pre-marriage counseling, we go through the five love languages. It's an excellent book. The premise of it is pretty simple and powerful, which is why it's been translated into so many languages and it's sold millions of copies. But the five love languages basically says this. The way that you want to be loved is also the way that you show love and that we're all kind of geared differently in the way that we show love and, and want to be loved. And if your partner, if your spouse doesn't share the same love language with you, you have to work hard to love him or her the way he or she wants to be loved. And then vice versa, you have to work hard to interpret what he or she is doing to you as a demonstration of love. And he kind of goes through, he breaks it down into five things. Uh, quality time, words of affirmation, physical touch, acts of service, and gifts. Those are like the five love languages. Now, obviously, who doesn't like any of those? I mean, you know, gifts, I like gifts. Quality time, yeah, I'm in, you know. Physical touch, Shannon, give me a hug, you know, tickle my back. I mean, it's just, you just, the list goes on, we love them all. 
But words of affirmation for some people, I mean, that's the top of the chart. They need to be encouraged. They need to be told, I love you. They need to be told, you've done a good job. That's so important to them. It's important to all of us. So if you need to know that you're loved and you haven't heard it from anybody in a while, let me tell you what you can do on a daily basis. You can turn to this book right here, and from Genesis to the Revelation of John, there's going to be one message that's going to be spoken to you every time you're willing to pick it up. And you're going to hear the voice of God saying, I love you. I love you. I love you. If you're a words of affirmation person and you haven't heard the words that affirm you lately, get in the word of God. And just as we tell the kids on Wednesday night, make no mistake about it, no matter what, God loves you. That's what you need to know. And then we're going to wrap up on Thursday. Um, and, 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 and I will say this, when you read through those passages about God's love, it's essentially going to bring you to the passion of our Lord. You know, with, with John chapter 13 being the, the Last Supper, then it'll bring you to the crucifixion, then to the empty tomb, and then to his appearance where he reconciles Peter to himself. But, but that speaks powerfully to what God did for us in Jesus Christ because of his love. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. And then the last day of VBS, Thursday night, we're going to be talking about Acts chapter 16, the story of Paul and Silas in prison. And we're going to talk about joy in the Lord. And we're going to tell the kids that ultimately where are they going to find their happiness and their purpose, their peace in life, it's going to be in their relationships with Jesus Christ. God, through Christ, will give them ultimate joy. Again, the story of Acts chapter 16, it's not a myth, it's not made up, it really happened. What is the story? We'll run it, but Thursday you're going to read it, right? Because you've copied it down, you're concerned about our kids, you're concerned about our leaders, you're going to pray each day for vacation Bible school, but most importantly, uh, you're wanting to grow in your own relationship with the Lord, so you've written it down, you're going to read Acts 16, and what you're going to find is this, that Paul and Silas have been proclaiming the truth of Jesus Christ. You'd think that people would really want to listen, but they don't. Uh, they actually get arrested. They're beaten with rods many times, and then they're thrown in prison. And while they're in prison, the, the prison is, already has occupants. And we're told the occupants of the prison, the other prisoners, are, are listening to Paul and Silas as they are grumbling and complaining to the Lord about their circumstances and how they were actually supposed to have made their way to Thessalonica by then to, in order to preach to the people in Thessalonica because of the big event that was going on in Thessalonica. And, well, no, that's not what it says, is it? No, it says that the other prisoners were listening to Paul and Silas do what? Sing. Sing hymns and praises to God. How many prisoners... I mean, we're not talking guys who have a good lawyer or gals who have a good lawyer and are basically planning on getting out pretty soon because they're going to get bailed out. I'm talking prisoners who have been beaten severely and then thrown in prison with, with no hope of release are singing praises and hymns and are full of joy. While they're singing hymns and, and praises to God, an angel comes and blows the doors of the prison open and then not only that, uh, they're shackled, their shackles come unloose. But it's not just their shackles that are, that are broken. As we talked about break every chain. It's not just their chains. It's not just Paul and Silas. Every prisoner in there, the, his chains are broken. The, the prison guard is aroused by all this activity. I don't know how the angel did it, but it woke him out of his sleep. And when he realizes the doors are open, he thinks, he presumes all the prisoners are gone. He grabs his sword. He's going to run himself through because that would have been his penalty anyway for dishonoring the community and for letting these criminals escape. And just as he's about to do it, he hears from the, within the prison, hey, hey, time out. Don't do that. We're all here. Yet not just me and Silas, all of us, like everybody. And he looks in and sure enough, and what does he say? Gentlemen, what do I need to do to have what you have? What must I do to be saved? Our kids are going to hear great lessons from us about joy, about God's love, about hope, about belief, about God caring. They're going to hear great lessons from us this week. But what they really need to hear isn't so much our words. What they really need to see 
is our action as adults. Yep, it was amazing that Paul and Silas were praising in the midst of such difficulty. Even more amazing that they were content to stay right where God had them when any person in his or her right mind from an earthly perspective would have ran out of that prison. Let's live our lives. Let's run the race in such a way that those who share in our lives, especially the young people, see that we really do want to honor the Lord. We do believe that he cares for us, and, and we do trust in the hope that he has for us, not just in this life, but the life to come, eternal life. That we, we trust that he can change us over time. He can make us into the women and the men that he wants us to be for his glory and for his honor. And that he gives us joy. Is it a fake joy that we put on, you know, just when we're around other church? No. Can we be real about our failures and our sins? Yes. Can we tell people that we struggle to believe at times? You bet. But guess what? In all of it, there is joy in the Lord Jesus Christ. When our kids see that, Hopefully, as the years go on, they're going to become the teachers. And they're going to sit down with kids in decades to come. And they're going to say, you know what? I learned these things when I was a kid at your age. But then as I continued to grow up here, right here in this church, I experienced these things. And I watched in the lives of the saints who went before me what it means to live for Jesus Christ, to run the race in order to win. Amen? As we close out our worship, our final song speaks to everything that we've talked about. Christ is enough. And so as we close out our service, I want to extend a, a challenge for you for prayer. Obviously, you come forward at the altar as the Holy Spirit leads you. But if you're comfortable coming forward to pray for our VBS program, to pray for our kids and our leaders, please do that. Lift them up this morning before the Lord. But also, if everything that we talked about, if there's one of those areas that hit you directly, where you realize, you know what? It's been a long time since I've felt like a kid. It's been a long time since I've been able to trust like a kid and not worry and stress. And I need that kind of trust and, and that kind of belief. I mean, you, you need to come and ask the Lord. Remember, what we're teaching the kids, we need to live first in order to really teach it to them. Jesus will help you believe. Jesus will give you hope. Jesus cares about you. Jesus loves you. Jesus will give you joy. If you need any of those things, you come up here and you ask Jesus for it today. And then let's glory in the fact that he will give it to you as you ask. Knock and the door will be opened. Seek and you will find. Let's stand and sing together. Christ is enough.